Our final video in this series brings us into the historical period that overlaps with Abraham. Sargon the Great became famous as the mighty king who conquered all of Mesopotamia and founded the Akkadian Empire. In a similar way, Ur-Nammu later became famous for establishing the empire known as Ur-3. Ur of the Chaldees is the city that Abraham left to travel to the promised land of Canaan, but it's hard to know exactly when he did so. Although the historical period begins with the Akkadian Empire, facts and absolute dates for this time are relatively uncertain. The power that men wield over other men started in one city, which was Babel, during the Ubaid period, and grew to become the so-called worldwide empire so large that Shulgi described himself as king of the four corners of the universe. At the same time, it's important to contrast the powerful cities of Mesopotamia with the Amorites to the northwest, who were described as a people that had no known cities. They were shepherds. Abraham was an Amorite and a Hebrew living in Ur, so he was right in the middle of the most important movements of his day. Babylon was hardly to be found. There was a mention of Babylon when Sharkali Shari built a temple there, but Babylon was neither large nor influential at that time. It wasn't even mentioned in the Sumerian king list and in the many Sumerian city-state lists. In fact, the old Babylonian empire didn't begin until 320 years after it was first heard of. This is why I keep saying that those who insist that Babylon is Babel create confusion and make a roadblock to sound exegesis and discussion. We need to follow the facts. This list shows six cities in Mesopotamia and the kings that ruled over them. Notice at the top that you have Gilgamesh ruling over the city of Uruk. At the beginning of the early dynastic period, which we discussed in part 10 of this series, we find one king ruling over one city. Gradually, city-states expanded to the point that they fought over the boundaries of their land. Then, at the end of the early dynastic period, as we see at the bottom of the list, Lugal Zagisi became king over six cities. As population and commerce grew, so did power. The early dynastic period came to an end when Sargon the Great defeated Lugal Zagisi at the Battle of Uruk and established the Akkadian Empire. This was a turning point in history. Sargon not only gained control over the cities of southern Mesopotamia, but he expanded his, his kingdom into an empire. His powerful army moved north and west to defeat the kingdoms of Mari and Ebla. This gave him at least temporary control over the Near East from the Persian Gulf to the Mediterranean Sea. No one had ever wielded this much power before. The Akkadian Empire that Sargon founded was a dynasty perpetuated by six of his descendants, as shown here. The kings appear in capital letters on the left. Sargon himself extended the empire to the Mediterranean. When his son Rimush took over, however, he had to reconquer the cities of Sumer, such as Ur, Uma, and Adab. They had revolted against the tyranny of this ruthless family, but were no match for the formidable size of Rimush's army. It is said that 56,000 people were annihilated from cities in Sumer. When Rimush died, his brother Manishtu took over leadership. He pillaged his way down the shores of the Persian Gulf and up the Tigris River until his assassination. The harsh expansionist tactics of these two brothers resulted in the strongest empire yet being handed over to Naram Sin. Naram Sin extended the empire toward the Mediterranean Sea, Armenia to the north, and into the Zagros Mountains to the east. Eventually, the Gutian raiders from the east succeeded in reducing the empire to a small area around Akkad. This happened either during the reign of Naram Sin or immediately after it. The next three kings had anarchy all around them. 
This led to 37 years of dark ages before Earth 3. Just how certain are the kings, places, and dates of the Akkadian Empire? The answer is important because many fantastic theories are being presented today as near certainties when they are nothing more than wild speculation. Uncertainty characterizes the Akkadian period as well as the prehistoric period before it. For instance, we don't even know where the city of Akkad was located. Archaeologists narrow it down to a region between Ur and Nineveh, and probably between Samara and Kish. Just imagine what that means. Unlike Ur III, Isin, Larsa, and the old Babylonian Empire, there is no capital city of the Akkadian Empire that can be excavated to identify the palace of the kings. Everything depends on what other cities wrote about it. Since we can't find Akkad, how accurate are the writings about it? Most of the kings that are said to have existed before Sargon the Great are only supported by the Sumerian king list shown here, which was fabricated by the Akkadians to justify their divine right of kings. The oldest copy is linked to Shulgi, who lived 235 years after Sargon the Great. The Sumerian king list gives 14 dynasties between the Flood and Sargon the Great. These include the cities of Kish or Eridu, Uruk, Ur, Awan, Hamazi, Adab, Mari, and Akshak. Certain kings are said to have reigned up to 1,200 years, and all dynasties were sequential, both of which we know to be false. It's unfortunate that mainstream archaeologists do not reject the Sumerian king list altogether, but instead use it to support many kings that cannot be confirmed through archaeology. Since there was no calendar in early times, years were named for events, kings, and special officials. This is very helpful for the first millennium BC, but less reliable for the second millennium BC. Take Sargon the Great, for instance. The Sumerian king list says that he ruled for 56 years, but only four year names have been found for him. So the claim of 56 years cannot be substantiated by detailed facts. Remish has only one year name to support a claim of nine years. I don't know of any for Manishtushu. Naram Sin had 20 year names out of a claimed 56, 56 year reign. The year names can even disagree between different versions, so trusting the king lists is as much a matter of faith as trusting the Bible for chronology. The research paper that you see here by archaeologist Doug Petrovich supports the idea that Sargon the Great was Nimrod, and it points out many similarities between these powerful rulers. The most obvious problem that he must overcome is that Nimrod is mentioned in the second generation after the flood, and Babel was in the fourth generation after the flood. Sargon lived much, much later. To make Nimrod equal with Sargon, Dr. Petrovich draws upon the fact that Nimrod is mentioned in Genesis 10.8 separately from the five sons of Cush in verse 7. He takes the phrase Cush begat Nimrod to mean that Cush was a distant ancestor of Nimrod. While this may be possible, it's not a, the most straightforward interpretation. The most notable mighty man from Sumerian history around the time of Babel was Gilgamesh, king of Uruk. In my opinion, Nimrod is mentioned separately from his brothers because he was not like the others. He was the only one in the table of nations who did not become a separate nation. Quite differently from all the rest, Nimrod founded a kingdom that crossed national boundaries. There are so many different ways to date this period that I will need a completely separate series to fully explain chronology. Here is one possibility. The biblical events at the bottom come from Floyd Nolan Jones, who follows Usher. The events of Sumerian history on the top follow a revised system where Akkad begins in 2117 BC rather than the traditional date of 2334 BC. The fall of Babel, 101 years after the flood, 
determines the beginning of the Uruk period, which overlaps the early dynastic period, as I discussed in part 10 of this series. Terra would have been born nine years before Sargon began ruling, and Abram would have been born during the decline of the Akkadian Empire. That means that Terra and Abram left Ur at the time when it had fallen into anarchy. Ur-Namu has been proposed as one of the five kings that captured Lot, according to Genesis 14. Ur-Namu, starting as the local ruler of the city-state of Ur, founded the empire called Ur-3. He is remembered for establishing the oldest laws known as the Code of Ur-Namu that preceded the laws of Hammurabi by over 300 years. Ur-Namu also built the enormous ziggurat at Ur, which was finished by Shulgi, as well as the ziggurat at Eridu. These were the first true ziggurats, having multiple levels. The predecessors of the ziggurats at Eridu and Uruk were single-level raised platforms and were built at least 350 years before the ziggurats. Contrary to popular belief, the Tower of Babel was definitely not a ziggurat. It was a raised platform with only one level. The dynasty of Ur-3 had five kings. Ur-Namu and Shulgi were followed by Aram-Sin, Shu-Sin, and Ibi-Sin. I have now completed a rapid overview of life after the flood, which I hope helps to identify the places where people lived after the flood through the lifetime of Abraham. This period of time covers at least 570 years to the end of Ur-3. Ur-3 ended when Jacob was in Haran working for Laban, according to this timeline. The study of history from Noah to Abraham that I call Biblical Paleoarchaeology is foundationally important to theology. It spans at least as much time as from the printing of the Gutenberg Bible 40 years before Columbus discovered America to the present, and we know how much history transpired during those centuries. Having covered the places, I look forward to working on a new series on the time from Noah to Abraham. This will deal with the many complex issues of absolute dating the past. If you have learned anything about archaeology, then subscribe to this channel to learn more. The playlist, Life After the Flood, reconstructs a biblical model of life between Noah and Abraham. This is how archaeology works. It uses known facts to create a hypothetical scenario that is open to scrutiny. I have combined conservative hermeneutics with sound archaeology to create a model for biblical paleoarchaeology. You won't find such a clear and detailed study anywhere else. I promise to keep each video short. If you have learned something about the Bible as history and how God walks with mankind, then subscribe to this channel and tell others about it. I'm on a mission to educate everyone about the most ignored, misrepresented, and crucial period of human history. Join me by educating yourself and by telling others about life after the flood.